Coming to you live from the Vegas Video Network Studios, just steps from the Las Vegas Strip, it's Top of the Food Chain. And now your host, he's one part mohawk, two parts attitude, and a touch of what the f***, it's Al Mancini. lot of them out there today. They're all my relatives, but um, <laughs> they think I'm kidding, but that's true. Hey, welcome to Top of the Food Chain. I am your host, Al Mancini, the food writer who is 10 times as colorful as the GAT, 100 times more informative as the GAT, and a heck of a lot cheaper if anyone out there at Google is listening and wants to buy me. <laughs> so welcome to Top of the Food Chain. We are here at the Vegas Video Network, home to many, many great programs that you can find at VegasVideoNetwork.com. Um, here at Top of the Food Chain, we'd like to take your questions. So we've got a live chat going on, and it's apparently now even easier to log in and check it out. That's what I've been told. So get on, get on board. We're going to be talking. It's tailgating season today, so we're going to be talking burgers with one of the world's experts on burgers. So if you want to know how to impress your friends at your tailgating party now that football season's underway, get on that chat line now, and we will get the question into Master Chef Kerry Simon in just a few minutes. In the meantime, if you've got questions for future shows, Shoot them to us via email. That's food at VegasVideoNetwork.com. Of course, in addition to being seen here at Vegas Video Network, being seen on my website, AlMancini.net, on iTunes, on YouTube, on Roku, on who are we with now, Scott, again? We are everywhere. <laughs> everywhere, OK. So you can't not find us. In addition to all of those video places you can see us, you can hear us and all the Vegas Video Networking programming on the networking programming. All the Vegas Video Network programming runs every Friday night at KSHP 1400 AM here in Las Vegas. If you're listening to us there and you have a question for future shows, you can dial it in. That number is 866-966-4599. And that sounds like about it for the things I need to plug, which again, gets longer and longer every week. So let's get this show kicked off. Scott, how are you today? I am well, my brother. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I've had an interesting week, man. What you been up to? Well, actually, just for the got my first drink just before the show over at the new Barrymore right next door. Here. Oh, that, well, now you stopped by there last week, right? They were still under, con under construction last week, so I took a little tour. But, I mean, you know, the hotel, the Royal, does not look that accommodating <laughs> when you see it from the outside. Well put. It does not look like the kind of place that you'd want to book a vacation, but they're kind of transforming it into a boutique hotel. And you can check out the pictures at my website at almancini.net. I mean, this place is just really, really cool. Very hip, very old school Vegas, elegant. It's going to be open three meals a day, and I haven't eaten there yet. They've only been open since Saturday. But, you know, got a little pre-show drink over there, and it was, it was pretty cool, man. So I highly recommend you check it out. What kind of food? Uh, it's going to be kind of continental cuisine, you know, just a little bit of recognizable stuff. You know, you got steaks, you got fish and chips, you got, you know, and, and some little twists. We got the chef from Holstein's working over there, as well as the pastry chef from Holstein's. So, the, you know, quality food over there, hopefully. I'm hoping, but I want to give them a little time to get on their feet before I check out the food. Cool. Also this week, man, I had the, oh, this was great, Scott. I had the first white truffle of the season to hit the American shores. And that, if yeah, I know you're a truffle fan, right, Scott? Well, I'm a chocolate truffle fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, white truffles, any foodie will tell you, is um, you know, one of the great gourmet um, things you can ever have. One of the most expensive you know, things. By the end of this season, they'll likely be going for about two to $3,000 a pound. That's Jeez. what they'll sell them to the restaurants for. Jeez. So the first one snuck in. They got it at Guy Savoie. Again, we've got some pictures up on the, the website. But Great experience, but you know, Scott, you know how I always try to tell people not to be intimidated by fine dining? I do know that. Well, you should have been at Guy Savoie that <laughs> night, <laughs> because we, it was me, John Curtis, and Franck Savoie, and we were in the lounge, so we got a little boisterous, and it was a little loud. And then Michelle Richard, none other than Washington, D.C.'s famed Michelle Richard, walks in and sits himself down at the table next to us, and within... I'd say 20 minutes, Frank and John and Michelle, I mean, these great names, well, not John, he's not a great name, but Frank and Michelle, great names of the food world, start just singing like the French national anthem and French anthems and songs and Frere Jaca at the top of their lungs. I mean, just incredibly loud in this world-class Michelin two-star restaurant where it costs, you know, people are spending $1,000 on dinner for two. 
And I just kept thinking to myself, if all of my friends out there who are afraid to walk into these restaurants were to walk in now and see these you know, luminaries of the culinary world just um, kind of having a good time cutting loose and, and shouting at the top of their lungs, you would agree with me. There's nothing to be afraid of about that restaurant. <laughs> so next time, you know, ask for Frank and Michelle next time that you guys want to check that place out and nice. hang out in the lounge. Nice. And finally, Zagat, man. The Zagat Guide, as big I news. alluded to, big news, big got news. sold um, by, it sold to Google for, I'm sure, a bajillion dollars, because Google doesn't buy anything for less than a bajillion dollars, I don't think. And yeah, Zagat, the Zagat Guide, I kind of have to give them credit. They're a competitor of mine. I mean, I've got my own book, Eating Las Vegas, 50 Essential Restaurants. Zagat, I've never liked, because what they basically do is they just poll people, the average schmuck on the street, and they ask them what, what they think, and they can... They can write about any restaurant they want, and they have to rate it in three categories between a zero and a three. So, Scott, I'm curious what you think, because my book, you have three experts, and we say what we think, and you know who we are. The, if you've got a guy who's never eaten any place better than a TGI Fridays, <laughs> and so for him, a TGI Fridays is a three. And then you've got a guy who's eaten at Joel Robichon, and he's eaten at Guy Savoie, and he's eaten at world-class restaurants, and maybe he goes into an Elaine de Costa restaurant, and compared to those other great places, he gives that a two. He says, okay, Elaine Dacasse is a two because Robichon's a three. Does it make any sense in the world that that guy's vote, giving Elaine Dacasse a two, gets weighed the same as the idiot who gave TGI Fridays a three? Okay, Mohawk aside, you realize you sound a little snobby right now. I don't think, I think if the person is going to be voting in the same book that has a TGI Fridays, and a Robichon, then the rating, he should have to rank them somehow. He can't just decide to only rank the TGI Fridays and give it a three, and then have someone else who has more experience give a, a much better restaurant a two because he's comparing it differently. It doesn't, it doesn't make that much sense to me. I don't know. That's why I don't really like Yelp. But why, well, why is Yelp doing so well? Why did Zagat's do so well? Um, well, it's a gat, first Zagat's, of all. <laughs> it, it rhymes with the cat. Okay. Okay, you can remember it that way. Sorry. Um, <laughs> they did well because, I mean, they were very well marketed. Um, Yelp does well because everybody likes to get online. But, you know, you've got a problem with things like that. Because, and you're going to have it now with Google being behind Zagat because now anyone who has a grudge against a restaurant yeah. can get online and just give it a zero. And anyone who works at a restaurant, no matter how much it sucks, can get online and give it a three. And that's being weighed the same as people who actually know what they're talking about. I don't know. So you really, you prefer the, the mass, what do you, who do you think, who do you well, side with? The, the I, professional or the, the general public? I don't know that I side with either. Um, I think that if I'm doing research about a particular restaurant, I'm going to do a Google search or a Bing search or whatever and see what people say. I'm more likely to ask somebody that I know, first and foremost, if they've been to that particular restaurant, whether it's you or you know, Fred down the street, just to know whether they think it's a play or not. Um, and it's, it's, like, it's like looking at a vacation place. If you're going to pick out a, pla a vac uh, vacation place in Mexico, you're bound to see some people say very bad things about it. Um, but you look at the majority of it, and if the majority of people say it's pretty good, you're probably going to be all right. That's the way I kind of look at it. Yeah, but you say first you're going to ask somebody you know. That's what a professional reviewer is. He's somebody you get to know after reading 20 or 50 or 100 of their reviews. And you know whether they're a pompous ass or you know whether they're, you know, uneducated. But you know, you know who each reviewer is. Well, that, I don't know who any of these people are that write for Zagat. But if I ask my buddy, uh, should I go to KGB's, he probably already knows that I'm a big hamburger guy. He knows me personally. Um, and I might get a more accurate uh, recommendation from him than from somebody like you who may have a completely different taste or maybe more sophisticated taste. Like you said, you know, the TGI Fridays, you know, I kind of like TGI Fridays. Yeah. You know, I, I don't beer mind. There, eat some chips and I'm okay. I see, here's the thing, and if you read my book, I mean, I stick up for a lot of places that are not super, super high end. I do not mind if somebody digs a TGI Fridays. What I mind is giving them a number grade on the same scale that you would give a Robichon. That, but, that weighting, that mathematical yeah, but they're not. But they're not comparing. It's not apples and apples. What they're saying is, for a TGI Friday kind of restaurant, it's as good as a, it's better than Applebee's, for example. They're not comparing it to the Simons. 
But then at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, Zagat does come out and they list them and somebody's got a 28 and someone has 27, which is a 2.8 average or 2.7 average. And they do say that's better. But don't they, they do. At but, the front, they say the best restaurants by food, the best restaurant. And so it, the, the weighting of it makes no sense. But there's some classification, right? I mean, no, no. It's none. all across the board. One, so TGI Fridays could be a 30 as could be Simon. Yeah, absolutely. They could both be 30s. But the dollar, don't they, do they say anything about how much the place costs? They do say what they cost. But but that's the part overall, of the delineation there, I would argue. Mm, I don't think so. They don't separate it. They just mention it. But, okay, we've beaten this. It's a dead horse. Um, <laughs> go to my website again. We'll, we'll take comments on it. Everybody can tell me what a snob I am. <laughs> Which I like, because it's rare that I get called the snob of the food writing world. I'm usually the man of the people. But um, because I am a man of the people today, we are going to talk hamburgers. But because... I am a snob today. We're going to be bringing in one of the world's greatest chefs, great, definitely one of the world's greatest hamburger chefs, and a great fine dining chef as well, Kerry Simon. We're going to be back with him in just about 15 seconds. This is David Ivey for Pub Crawl. It's funny because is David. From, wait, you should, you should, no, you should just leave it on. Hi, I'm David Ivey from Pub Crawl, and you're watching the Vegas Video Network. And scene. And we are back on the Vegas Video Network, top of the food chain. I'm your host, Al Mancini. And with me is Kerry Simon. How are you, man? Good. Good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you as well. Not really that long. I guess I saw you at a party about a week and a half ago. Yep. Great party over at KGB. Thank you, thank you. Kerry's Gourmet Burgers is KGB. And of course, you run Simon at Palm's Place. Right. So, and a few other places in L.A. And, uh, yes, and you're opening in South America. I'm opening in the Dominican Republic in uh, Punta Cana, the hard rock there. And I'm in, um, I'm in Atlantic City, too. Oh, that's right. I forgot you were yeah. in Atlantic City. Yeah. And uh, my family lives just outside Atlantic City. So All right. You guys better go there. <laughs> um, the live audience. Yeah, I was just actually watching. <laughs> I was just watching um, a rerun of Entourage, and I recognized your LA restaurant in oh, one yeah. of the episodes. Yeah, I got in there. That was pretty cool. Was, that sign was right there. I was like, "Oh, wow." Yeah, I was watching it with my wife, and I was like, "That's Simon." And yeah. she's like, "What?" And I said, "That's Simon." And then the big sign comes up, and she's like, oh, yeah. "Of course you knew it was Simon. There's a sign." When that was on TV, my uh, texts were coming in. Like, it's amazing how many people watch that show. Just and just that little placement is like pretty. Well, incredible. In my book, I compare your restaurant to Entourage because I say there's a difference between being hip and trendy and being cool. Uh -huh. And I say it's the difference between Twilight, which is hip and trendy, and Entourage, which is cool. So yeah. I compare you. I say you are cool. Your restaurant, uh -huh. your restaurants are cool. Well, thank you. They're, and they also have a lot of beautiful people at them, but that's not the reason you go there. No. You go there because they're, they're very cool. You just be part of that whole thing, you know. Yeah. So, so you're a man of the people like myself. You're one of the first guys to... Um, to really to embrace um, comfort food. One right. of the first gourmet chefs to do that. You think I was being too snobby there, <laughs> talking about Yelp and Zagat's? No, I mean, I think that it's, uh, you know, I have to be very careful because mm. like, it's easy for me to irritate writers <laughs> and stuff. And no matter, so I don't really like to have an opinion <laughs> <Okay>. open. <laughs> so, <laughs> no but, problem. Uh, you know, I mean, you have a very good point, And there, should, there needs to be sort of a level of understanding of what it means. And people do take shots at uh, restaurants sometimes just because they're irritated or maybe they had a bad experience at the bar with some not even that relates to the restaurant. And then they go back and they write up this whole thing or they work at another restaurant. They want their restaurant to be busier. So it's kind of like, you know, you, you get some shots here and there. And, uh, you know, I've just, you just got to be thick-skinned about it. You know, it's like, well, what are you going to do? You're going to like, you can't respond. And uh, so you have to just try and right. live with it. And you have the same problem with some of my colleagues, professional food writers as well. Well, it's, you know, it's just, it's all opinions, right? But, I mean, I respect all their opinions. So, so you know, you were, I mean, a fine dining chef most recently at Prime Steakhouse here in Las Vegas before you went out on well, your own. that's ride. how I ended up here, yeah. That's how you came to Las Vegas. Where'd but you'd work for John George Von Gerichten at several restaurants. Well, we were, I traveled for him, and I opened restaurants all over the world for him, and I helped him develop his company and uh, put actually put together the whole program. Uh, it was the first restaurant it was in Hong Kong, Vong Kong is what we called it. And um, I literally, I'd worked for John George before in the 80s. We had a long relationship together there at a place called Lafayette. And um, so when he started to grow, he called me and asked me if I could help him. And I flew to Hong Kong and did a deal for him. And then after that, we had a bunch of other places. We did London. Uh, 
New York, uh, Bahamas, and I ended up here in uh, Vegas, and um, I stayed. They wanted me to come back to New York, and I decided that it was, I liked Vegas at the time, you know, I mean, I still do, and um, I, uh, I stayed on, I met Peter Morton, and that's how that happened. Yeah, and when you went to the Hard Rock, yeah. it was unheard of for a chef of your caliber to make meatloaf, yeah. and to make cotton candy for dessert, and to make what people would refer to, and I know you find, sometimes find the term overused, but people would refer to as comfort food. And you seem to think, and this is what I love, because I try to tell people, you know, that I try to bring fine dining to regular people, because there are people like you bringing regular food to fine dining levels. Yeah. I think we've got to mix it all up, you yeah. know? What was, how much flack did you get for doing that? And what was your, what was your Well, I still get flack for it, you know, but um, I mean, it, that's just, to me, it's like, you know, you don't understand the business then because the intensity that I put into anything I do is the intensity that I did when I was trained and working in four-star New York restaurants or three-star France, rest, French restaurants. Um, you know, I, that sticks with me now, you know, and more, as I work with my cooks and redevelop recipes, it's the same philosophy, you know, it's just that, the food label is different. I'm not fooling around with, say, Ocetra caviar or foie gras. I, you know, and I try to, I want, you know, I like to make a lot of people happy. I like the, uh, the experience of dining at a table and they come and they share food, you know. For me, that was more appealing than a restaurant where it was a little bit more, you know, reserved and, you know, you had to behave yourself and, you know, it was just dress codes. I just, I didn't find that. Yeah, and talk about dress codes. I mean, you, you invite people to come to your Sunday brunch at Simon at, at in, Palm's in, Place in their pajamas. Yeah, pajamas <laughs> or negligees, whatever yeah. you got. It's great. I mean, seriously, it's if I, unfortunately I don't wear. I sleep in the nude, so I didn't think you wanted me coming that way. Probably so not. I, yeah, Probably not. Wouldn't be good for business. It'll be but. Mohawk Day for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it's it's great. And now you went into. The gourmet burger business. Yeah. And gourmet burgers have kind of swept the country over the past eight years or so. Mm -hmm. And now you were a pioneer in the comfort food, and so it makes total sense for you to go into doing hamburgers. Right. I mean, I've always been, you know, I've always been fascinated by the fact of that type of food. Like, like you mentioned the meatloaf, and, but I have tuna tartare. But hamburgers, uh, you know, I grew up with it. So, you know, White Castle or, you know, I loved In-N-Out burgers. And when I was on Iron Chef, you know, that was turned out to be the subject was ground beef, and we, I did a hamburger. And that's actually why I feel like I won, was because I did the ultimate hamburger. And I added some, uh, some uh, smoked uh, bacon into it, and some oregano, and some uh, shiitake mushrooms. And it just took it to a different dimension. And that's, in general, how I look at things. But the other side of that is, is that I always look at food as the pureness of it, and what we really had before we started fooling with products and putting in hormones or whatever. So I thought, what did they make a hamburger like in, before, in the, like years and years and years ago? And so that's what I try and attach myself to. I look up recipes online and see if I can do research to find that out. And uh, that's the path. And it's great. And then you do incredibly creative things like um, Captain Crunch milkshake, yeah. which has got to be one of the yeah. greatest things. Yeah, I, already, I offer some twist to the whole thing. So it is um, the NFL season's kicking off, yeah. I guess, even as we speak. I think yeah. somebody's probably kicking off, or I don't know exactly what time. So there are going to be people out for the next several weeks or maybe months tailgating. Yeah. And what more at a tailgate party than, do you need than a good hamburger? Yeah. But the average person, of course, is going to go and, or, you know, if you're doing it in your backyard while you watch the game. So I want to talk about how to make a good burger, not going out and grabbing, you know, these right. frozen patties at your local supermarket and pulling them from between the paper, right. but what it takes to make a really great burger. You mind sharing some tips with people? Well, the most important thing is, is that whatever meat you choose, you don't smash it. You know, I, I believe that you put it on the grill. You get it the temperature you want. You check your heat to see how, like, if you're going to have it rare or medium rare. I like a nice, for myself, I like a nice char-grilled uh, burger. Um, but don't, don't take your spatula and smash it. You're squeezing out all the juices of it, and you're going to end up with a dry burger, you know. And Because uh, people love to do that. love to take the sm spatula, and then the flame well, yeah. goes up, and it looks cool. <laughs> and, you know, you have another beer, and another flame goes up. But it's <laughs> destroying the burger, you're, right? Well, it's squeezing the juices out of it. Right. So, 
And uh, but I, you know, everybody thinks that that's the way to do it, and that's my opinion. So. Okay. And once again, you got you have to watch the heat. As far as the quality of beef goes, I, I really think it's a personal thing. You know, you can get everything out there you want now. It's like I usually go for 80, 20 percent. So 80, you know, 20 percent lean. Um, and I think that uh, you know, forming it, keeping it cold is very important. You know, to get the right formation that you want. Uh, usually. We try and uh, get the burgers out of the refrigerator for a few seconds before we cook them to get not room temperature, but to get them, you know, a little bit more temperate than usual. Okay, so to, to take it step by step, so if you're going to just get ground beef at your supermarket, yeah. you, you personally like to go with an 80-20 right. mixture of lean to yeah. fat. What if you're, you know, you're lucky enough that you can actually have somebody grind it up themselves for you, you know, your butcher will grind up. Are there certain cuts you like to mix or certain oh, types of beef? I mean, it's endless now, you know, from Kobe on to, you know, whatever, brisket and everything. So, you know, you can go, uh, you, all these people have different recipes. They've taken the burger to the other end. So it depends on what, you know, you can do sirloin if you, I mean, it's. it's What's your classic, your classic Iron Chef burger? I'd for say example. Chuck is probably, ch ch well, I, that's not true because I added in bacon and some other things to the meat. And, you know, it was it was a little probably richer, and I just did a Kobe burger just recently with bacon, and you know, it, it I think it depends on what you're in the mood for too. You know, I mean, it's like oh, I'm gonna I, explore, experiment is always a good thing with cooking. I've never really understood Kobe in a burger because the beauty of Kobe is it's a very high fat content, yeah. but the way that it's marbled in, you don't feel like you're just eating a lot of fat. To me. Once you grind it all up, and I'm not an expert, but once you ground it all up, it's really just a high-fat beef, right? You could just throw scrap fat into regular beef, well, and it would be. That's the beauty of it all, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just a rich burger, and it's right. that Kobe. Uh, the, uh, don't, don't take me wrong. I'm not a real. I'm not pushing Kobe here. I, you can do get away with it with other fats too, but um, like the bacon fat or whatever. But Kobe definitely adds a richness to it that the other ones don't have. So when you form your patties, I mean, of assuming you've, everything you form by hand, about how thick do you like a patty? If you you're can, gonna, let's say you're putting it on a grill in the backyard. Yeah. You know? Well, d I mean, I, you know, it depends on how how you want to do it. You know, I mean, it's uh, like redo it a little, like pretty. It's not. I don't know how many inches that is, but probably about that. Okay. So about it, yeah. But we have a mold right. that you put it in, so it's like all even, and um, but. As, as I remember, you know, like I was thinking about it on the way over, is like burgers that we used to do when we were kids were just thrown together and put it on. They sure tasted great to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so forget all this gourmet stuff. I, you just know, have fun with it. There's at some point it's just like whatever happens, enjoy it. You know, it's like the, 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 maybe that sometimes when you do things sort of haphazardly, they turn out better than when you put so much effort into it. And okay. I, I'm not, you know, it's hard to say. We've got a question, Scott. Do you like working with any other meat besides beef? Um, uh, well, I work with everything. We work with chicken. We do turkey burgers, salmon burgers. We have vegetarian. We got an award for our vegetarian burger. So uh, this, and nothing is uh, out of my hands. You know, you mentioned the vegetarian burgers, and because yeah. a lot of people, you know, if they're going to be barbecuing or tailgating, there are a lot of vegetarians yeah. and vegans out there. And I know you're a health, pretty healthy eater, eater yourself. I try. Um, you don't always want to go get one of these processed garden burgers. Is a is a garden patty or a vegetarian patty something people can make at home? Uh, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff online, a lot of recipes online that are easy to follow. There's quinoa you can use as a base. You can use black beans. You know, there's so many different things. It it's sort of that's another thing that you once you you open up that can of worms, it's amazing how many different recipes there are out there and things that you can do and products that you can put into it. And then, I mean, if you're in a rush or whatever, you, a Whole Foods has some good burgers, too, you know, some good right. frozen burgers. That you, I know you're not, you don't want to push that. Much. Well, no, I mean, if they, <laughs> nothing wrong with it at all, but, you know, it's always more fun to make it yourself yeah, if you have no, the time. Yeah, I agree. So once you've got it on the grill, first of all, you know, how, how do you measure the temperature of a grill when you're in, like, your backyard? Well, or? I mean, you know, you put it in the, it depends on how you're working, you know. You put it in the coals or what, charcoal briskets or whatever you're using, briquettes, or, and then um, let them get nice and sort of molded over, and, you know, you, you get good heat and you put it on. Like I said before, I like mine a little charred, so it's, it's okay like that. Um, there's a lot of different methods for that, but... And the thickness will make a difference when you're cooking it, you know. I like my burgers a little rare, medium rare. 
So it depends on how, mo how well you cook them or whatever, and then, and then that becomes the thickness and the temperature that you have. Any rule on how many times you maybe rotate it to square well, the meat or things I'm, like that? Or I mean, we've always, uh, I'm always taught you flip it once, you know, mm -hmm. but it's impossible. You know, you have to get the marks on two sides, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> it's like, right. It's, so you need to flip it, you know, at least four times, I think, to get the, the right marks on it, unless you have the... The, the grill has that sort of the square, the checkerboard, checkerboard on it already. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and exactly. then you're cheating, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, another question, Scott. Yeah, Food Fight wants to know, what about some gourmet seafood burgers like shrimp or lobster? Uh, well, we've done lobster before. I've actually done shrimp, too. Um, but not, not at either. Uh, uh, this was a long time ago. Um, and I've done, I've done it with shrimp, with smoked shrimp involved in it, too. Is that something you think somebody could do at home? Would you just need uh, a food processor? Or? I would say that you you probably could do it with a food processor. And the lobster too, you could you could probably do it at home too. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, you got a preference when it comes to buns, types of rolls, something that holds up better. I mean, you know, there's nothing worse to me than you get a nice fatty burger and it's juicy and yeah. you haven't you haven't slashed it down. It's still got that, and you put it on a kind of store bought packaged bun and it just falls apart. Well, I'm, you know, sesame is uh, one of my favorites, but we make all our buns at KGB, which is nice. They're made in house, every day fresh. So that's pretty, you know, it's, okay. yeah. I, and I, it, I, you know, how can you? Like have one favorite, you know, it's poppy seed or, you know, I, I don't know. That's a tough you question. find anything that doesn't work? Um, no, I don't know. Do you have one? Um, like I said, there's Wonder Buns. Sorry, oh, we're not uh, getting Wonder as a sponsor, are we, Scott? Uh, no, I, you know, I remember I used to really love the black bread in a burger, too, you know, with the, yeah. you know, tomato, red onion, and cheddar cheese was always like a, there was a burger place that used to make them by in Chicago area where I lived. You a fan of putting a lot of? Are there any mainstay ingredients? I know, of course, the book's wide open. You know, world's wide open. There's yeah. you can get burger cookbooks and yeah. things like that. But are there mainstay ingredients that you think you need? Certain spices, certain I don't know. People, some people throw bread in, whatever. Certain things you think needs to be in the mix. In when the mix. Yeah. No, just salt and pepper. Um, I keep it pretty pure. Yeah. Uh, you know, so like I said, sometimes I put in the smoked bacon, and I've put in uh, shiitake mushrooms and oregano and some shallots and things like that. But for the real hamburger, you just, it speaks for itself. Grilled flavor, just with cheddar cheese, tomato, that kind of thing. Tomato, ketchup and mustard, whatever your, <laughs> yeah, your condiment desire. All the basics. So when yeah. I try to mix up things that are too crazy at home, I'm just wasting time by throwing no, in a sheer sauce. Like I said <laughs> before, it's experimentation, you know. I think it's each person has their own kind of a path on that. Right. So, you know, we spoke a bit about the, the restaurants you have. What's coming up next? I know you've got maybe a new menu happening over at Pomp's Place. We started right? a new menu. Um, it's been, we've been developing it all summer and now it's finally in place, um, which is kind of nice. It's been some good changes on that. You have to come over and check that out. Sure. And um, KGB is, uh, we're going to fool around with a few new things on that menu as well. Um, yeah. So, new menu items you can kind of tease me with? Uh, I can't tease pops? you with anything. You can't tell me? You've got to come over and, uh, and experience it. Okay. We have a great lamb dish, though. It's like sort of more, uh, more a little Indian style. It's just like changed her from our other lamb dish. Over at KGB, do you do hot dogs, too? I can't remember. Yeah, we do. We what have that foot-long hot dog. And there, it's so. great. Yeah, yeah. It's, we have a great burger. I mean, a great hot dog over there. Cool. Question, Scott. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, I've even, like, I've had, like, in-room uh, sort of ribeye type of, type of thing, situation for a player who lost a lot of money, and we took care of that for him. You know, really, you take, try and take care of everybody, so no, I've, yeah. I've been pretty lucky with that. And you do, the, you do burgers over at um, Tom's Place as well as KFC, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's kind of yeah. become almost a signature dish of yours. Yeah, the burger isn't uh, on the menu per se at nighttime, but uh, during lunch it is and in room service. But you can ask for it. It's like one of those. And given how much comfort food that you do at KGB, you kind of, it's a little interest, or excuse me, at Palm's Place. Interesting, you also have an incredible sushi selection. Yeah. You think sushi's kind of become a new comfort food for people? I think it's part of American cooking, you know. I mean, I looked at it as being like, a, like everything is like in American food. It's like engulfed by it completely, you know. It's what Americans eat. So to me, that just makes it American food. That's kind of how I look at it. Okay. You know, so there's so many cuisines out there that Americans appreciate. Chinese, Thai, or, you know, Japanese. 
and it goes, the list goes on, Mexican, et cetera. Right. Um, well, actually, it looks like we're kind of running out of time. What? But I really appreciate having you down here. That was quick. <laughs> hey, time flies when you're having fun on TV. But, you know, I just want to thank you a lot for having you down here. Thanks for giving people some burgers. Oh, yeah, you're that's welcome. the important Hope thing. It. You know, I hope everybody's able to go out this weekend and um, take a little advice. Of course, the main thing, just have fun with it. Like and don't said. squeeze them. Don't squeeze don't them. Don't squeeze them. That's I'm it. telling you, don't squeeze the burger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody. You are watching, you have been watching Top of the Food Chain. I'm going to be back next week. Not quite sure who we'll have back, but um, it, it should be a fun show next week. And then in a couple weeks, actually, we're going to have a great show coming up. We're going to be doing truffles, an introduction to truffles. So stay tuned for that one. I think that's two to three weeks from today. Um, Kerry, man, thank you as always. You're welcome. It's always fun to see you, man. Nice to be here. Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.